before we get started. Our God and Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the opportunity this evening to, to gather together to study your word. And uh, Lord, for those that we've just mentioned, <clears throat> that uh, you know certainly what the situation, the circumstances are in, in each of those cases. And we just pray that uh, in, in each of those that the folks involved <clears throat> are going through the, the trial or the heartache, uh, number one, of course, are trusting you as their savior. And then number two, that uh, they would rest in that salvation and uh, have the peace that passes all understanding and be realize that their security, their hope is in Christ uh, and in what we have in him. Which in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we are going through dispensational distinctives and um, we are, I can't see what number... Uh, No, 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 no. Yeah, we're on number five and the one before. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I can't see the. No oh, that's seven. Five. How come it goes four, five, seven? Huh. That's interesting. Yeah. So that's. I'm sorry. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. We we well the number six. You know the six 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 and all that. We don't want to have the number six in there. So that's why they don't have a thirteenth floor in a in the Altoona hospital because you know you don't want you don't want that. So. Um, all right, the last one we looked at last week was this one, uh, number four. We believe that God's blessings for in dealing with the nation of Israel differed from his blessings for in dealing with the body of Christ. God's blessings for Israel involve both physical and spiritual blessings. Uh, and we referenced, of course, Abraham's problem, pro promise of the land, and then Ezekiel, the promise of the Spirit. But that promise of the Spirit also involved physical blessings for Israel. As a result, God dealt with Israel in both a physical and spiritual way. The only physical blessing that the body of Christ has to look forward to is the resurrection at the rapture. And we talked last week about the fact that we're going to have to, you know, reword that a little bit, and make it more clear exactly, you know, what we're talking about, that, that both, both Israel and the body have a spiritual element to our, to our salvation and a physical element to that. Uh, it's just that, that Israel's involves the earth and the church the body of Christ involves the heavenly places. And that's really one thing that in this whole section on dispensational distinctions, um, we didn't deal with, well, we didn't really teach right division in that way back in the day when this was put together, you know, looking at uh, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then at the end, there's still a heaven and earth and God's purpose and plan involves uh, making Jesus Christ the preeminent being in heaven and earth. So all of these will be redone a little bit, or redone in some way to take into account that idea of rightly dividing the truth by right dividing the word of truth by understanding the distinction, the difference between God's the fulfillment of God's program in the earth and the fulfillment of His program in the heavens. That there is one purpose, one goal that God has. And that is to make Jesus Christ, uh, to make him uh, gather together in one all things in Christ, but that that goal takes place in two places, in heaven and in earth. So we'll you know, kind of reword these to, to, uh, to reflect that fact. Um, and then what we didn't cover last week, number five, we believe the future destiny of Israel differs from the future destiny of the body of Christ. The hope of Israel involves resurrection into a literal, visible, physical, earthly kingdom over which Jesus Christ will reign. So let's go to Daniel chapter 2. Let's go ahead and pick up these verses as we, uh, as we study them. Daniel chapter 2. And Daniel 2 and, let's see, verse 44. Daniel 2 and verse 44. Daniel 2, verse 44. And of course, this is um, the recounting of the, the, the image that King Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. He sees this image, the head of gold, the, the, the chest and arms of silver, belly of brass, legs of, uh, uh, legs of brass, uh, feet of iron and clay. And then uh, in verse 44, in the days of these kings, that's the, the kings represented by the toes of the image, 
In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountains without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. The dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure." And of course, that, that verse uh, is, you know, Daniel is laying out there all the Gentile world powers, and then those Gentile world powers ultimately come down uh, by that which is cut out of the mountain without hands, which of course is Christ. He's going to bring a kingdom. Uh, in, in verse um, 45, for as much as thou sawest that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, that's reference to Christ. It break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold. The great God hath made known unto the king what shall come to pass. The dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. And in verse 44, it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and shall stand forever. So the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom here on the earth. And when the God of heaven sets up the kingdom here on the earth, um, it will be, as, as we say there, the hope of Israel involves resurrection to a literal, visible, physical, earthly kingdom over which Jesus Christ will reign. And this Daniel chapter 2 is a, a reference and a prophecy about that. If you go to Zechariah uh, chapter 14, Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4, Zechariah 14, 4 and 9. So Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a great valley, and half the mountain shall remove toward the north and half toward the south. And then if you go down to verse 9, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. So the Lord returns, his feet touch the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Olives cleaves in two, and you know, as a part of all that process, by the, when that L is completed in verse 9, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day, <coughs> excuse me, there shall be one Lord and his name one. So Jesus Christ comes, returns, sets foot on the earth, and rules and reigns on the earth. And then Revelation chapter 20, and verse 4, and Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4, we read, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death <clears throat> hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And again, that's a reference to the thousand year reign of Christ. Not, not the eternal reign, but this thousand year reign that comes um, at uh, uh, the kingdom uh, before the great white throne judgment and before the final judgment and then the final judgment comes here in that Revelation chapter 20 but the point is that there's a resurrection and they live and reign with him a thousand years and where they live and reign with him is here on the earth so Israel's hope is to be resurrected into a kingdom here on the earth and it's, it's the hope that um, you know, most people take that hope to be universal for the body of Christ also. So, you know, they'll talk about, well, I, I want to, in the kingdom, I want to come back and be the mayor of Altoona or be the, you know, the president of this or the governor of that because they feel like they're going to reign here on the earth. And that is certainly a part of what scripture talks about. And that, that would tie back into once we get more uh, verbiage in here about, you know, God has a purpose in the earth and he has a purpose in the heaven or he has one purpose that purpose of being fulfilled in the earth and being fulfilled in the heavens and so this next part of that the hope of the body of Christ involves being resurrected and raptured away to meet the Lord in the air to reign with Christ in his heavenly kingdom 
So 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 51. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. And 1 Corinthians 15 uh, is where we learn about our resurrection, but also where we learn that uh, as a part of our resurrection, we are also going to be changed. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we, we read there uh, in, in verse, uh, uh, verse 51, We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And in the context of the passage, the change that he's talking about, if you go back up to verse 49, As we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So the change is from bearing the image of the earthy, a body of flesh, it's equipped to function here on the earth, to bearing the image of the heavenly, a, a spiritual body that's equipped to function in the heavenly places. If you go back up uh, further in the passage in verse um, 40, there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. So again, a terrestrial body, of course that's a, a reference to a body that, that, that exists here on the earth, terra firma, terrestrial body, celestial body, one that exists in the heavenly places. In verse 44, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body, there's a spiritual body. So a natural body, one that, that, that is, is created by the processes of nature here on the earth, and then a spiritual body, one that is equipped to function in spiritual places, a spiritual being in heavenly places. So that, that whole, the hope of the body of Christ being resurrection and raptured away to meet the Lord in the air. Um, and we probably eliminate the word raptured there because raptured is not a, a good uh, Bible word. Uh, yeah, ju just could say the hope of the body of Christ involves being resurrected and caught away to meet the Lord in the air or caught up to meet the Lord in the air or whatever the case might be rather than using the word raptured. Um, and then 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 of course is uh, another passage that references that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 1 Thessalonians 4 13 But I would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So again, our, our destiny is not to have the Lord come here and establish a kingdom and rule and reign with us here on the earth. Our destiny is to be caught away uh, and to rule and reign with the Lord in the heavenlies. So that, that second hope of the body of Christ involves being resurrected and caught away to meet the Lord in the air, to reign with Christ in his heavenly kingdom. We further believe that the establishment of Christ's earthly kingdom with Israel and the catching away of the body of Christ to rule in the heavenly kingdom will, recur, will occur at the return of Christ to earth. So, and that's, you know, since we're here in 2 Thessalonians, let's turn over there. Um, so we, we had updated this a little bit, you know, based on our, our, our understanding of the end times. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, and, and let's go ahead and get Matthew 24 also. So we kind of compare Matthew 24. And there are a lot of similarities uh, between these passages. We, we could also use the 1 Thessalonians passage. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 and verse 29. Matthew 24, 29. 
So in Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So that, that passage, you know, it's, it's very similar to what we just read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that he will send his angels with the sound of great trumpet. They'll gather together his elect from the four winds, from the one in heaven to the other. If you look at the passage we just looked at in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you see those elements there. Verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So again, you have the angel of the Lord, you have uh, the archangel, you have the sound of the trumpet, and you have the angels coming and, and us rising up and being gathered together unto him. In the Matthew passage, you have the angels going forth and gathering the elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other, and the sound of a great trumpet to establish a kingdom on the earth. Um, also to establish a kingdom in the heavens. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7, To you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of his, uh, glory of, of, and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified with his saints and to be admired in them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So the passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 is the same. It's when Jesus Christ comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Uh, it comes when he, it's when he comes to punish them with everlasting destruction in the presence of the Lord. It's when he comes to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. So he comes, he catches his people away, he gathers his elect together. They are to be glorified with him. They are to be uh, rewarded uh, by him and, and, and his, their glory shines out his glory shines out through them, but at the same time, he comes to punish those that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So his return is that that day of the Lord is a day of punishment for those that don't believe, but a day of reward for those that do. It's good news for those that believe. It's very bad news for those that don't believe. So that's, and that's one of the elements that I think we've oftentimes missed, dispensationalists have oftentimes missed, um, mid-acts dispensationalists have oftentimes missed, that, that day of the Lord, you know, it is described as a day of darkness and gloominess and thick darkness and, and all the rest, but that is all the, the part of God, the day of the Lord that is judgment upon those that don't know Him. But there is also the part of the day of the Lord which is rejoicing by those that do know him because it's the day when God sets things right. It's the day when everything that is wrong in the world, and the list is getting longer every day, right? Everything that is wrong in the world is set right. Now, if you're on the wrong side of that, that's bad news. But if you're on the right side of that, that's wonderful news for those of us that understand the gospel and understand the truth and understand righteousness and understand what God's will is to see God, you know, uh, judge righteous judgment and set everything right is, is, is a great blessing, is a great thing. And every time the day of the Lord or, or most times the day of the Lord is described, it's, it's described in those two elements. Um, in fact, let's just, just pick up, just take a minute here and look at this. Go back to the book of Joel. Joel chapter 2. And in Joel chapter 2, of course, he, um, he's going to talk about what happens. Uh, Joel chapter 2, verse 1, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, 
sound an alarm in my holy mountain. This is Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh. It's nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. So, so that day of the Lord it, it, there is presented as a, a really, really bad thing. It's, it's, it's you know, a, a flame goes before them. It's like the garden of Eden in front of them. It's a desolate wilderness behind them. But if you read on down in that, chapter, verse 21, um, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Now, why, in this midst of a discussion of the day of the Lord and all the destruction of the day of the Lord, why in the world would Joel say, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things? Well, because if you're one of God's people, one of God's children, this is in connection with, with the nation Israel, if you're one of the remnant in Israel that, that believes and he's coming to destroy your enemies and establish his kingdom and make the land flow to milk and honey, then rejoice or fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. This is a great thing that he's doing. He's driving out the sinners from the land. He's going to establish his kingdom. And then he goes on to talk about that. Be not afraid, verse 22, ye beasts of the field. For the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit. The fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down to you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, and my great army which I, uh, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God uh, that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed and ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord Jehovah your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed so all of that is part of the day of the Lord so uh, all that good news and how does that how does that good news come if you look there in verse um, verse 25 I will restore unto you the years that the locust hath eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. How is God going to do all those wonderful things for Israel? With, with his great army. He's going, to, he's going to wipe the sinners out of the land with his great army, and... So if you're one of the ones, <laughs> sinner that's getting wiped out of the land, the day of the Lord is a day of darkness and gloominess. But if you're one of those believing remnant that's going to go in and possess the land and, and have the benefit of all that, then oh, this, this great army which I send among you. Do, you. do you think that the people that are being destroyed by that army are saying, oh, what a great army. Isn't that wonderful? No, they're, they're in... in, in, in uh, horror and terror. Go back to Isaiah chapter 13. And, and uh, as I said, as we, you know, studied the end times more and more, this is one thing that, that just, you know, became very apparent that, that, that oftentimes we miss with the day of the Lord because we think of it as just this terrible day of judgment. And it is a terrible day of judgment. But God is not going to judge His people He's not going to judge that remnant in Israel at his return. The, 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 the 70th week of Daniel is for chastening and purifying them. But at his return, he's coming to establish their kingdom. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 1, uh, The vision of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see, lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain, 
Uh, exalt the voice unto them, shake the hand that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. The noise of a multitude in the mountains, such of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all, man, all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the, uh, of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. I'm going to lay that land desolate, and I'm going to destroy the sinners out of it. Verse 10, for the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth. The moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. So, so what has he come to do? Verse 11, I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. So for, for the remnant that's following God and following Christ, following the true Messiah, is that good news or bad news when he comes to lay low the haughtiness and the arrogance of the wicked? It's good news for them. And if you read on down in the passage, um, well, to the next chapter, chapter 14, verse 1, for the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land and the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob and the people shall take them and bring them to their place and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids and they shall take them captives who captives they were and they shall rule over their oppressors and it shall come to pass in the day uh, that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. The Lord shall give thee rest and that's exactly the promise that Paul makes um, to you that are troubled. That, that passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. To you that are troubled, what's he say? Rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven in flaming fire or taking vengeance. What does he tell the nation Israel? When I come, you get to rest. So understanding that day of the Lord, understanding the return of Christ to the earth is it carries out that dual purpose of punishing and bringing judgment on sinners and driving the sinners out of the land uh, for Israel, but also of rewarding Israel with their kingdom, of catching away the body of Christ to our heavenly home. And, and all of that is accomplished at that return of when he comes to take back the universe and set things right. That's what the day of the Lord is. The day of man is a day when man reigns and man has his way. The day of the Lord is when that all gets reversed and the Lord reigns and the Lord establishes his way in his universe. So that's, you know, that dispensational distinction and that's, that's an important element of it that, that there's, there's one purpose that he has and he fulfills that in heaven and in earth. And he returns and does all that at his return. So that's the dispensational distinction of the future destiny of Israel and the body of Christ. So any questions or comments about that one? Okay. Then let's go to the next one. We believe the church, the body of Christ, and the dispensation of grace began in Acts 13 with the separation of Paul to his ministry. So this is um, just, just talking about the distinctiveness of Paul and his message. Uh, so if you go to Acts chapter 2, or uh, yeah, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 13 and verse 2, um, this is his separation. Uh, and, and, you know, I don't, I don't know that I would uh, 
that you have to pin it right to verse 2, but it's certainly in that 13th chapter of Acts that, that Paul is doing this. Acts chapter 13, verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And then Paul goes out, they begin that, that apostolic journey with Paul, uh, and he goes to preach. He preaches in Antioch, and then they, they, and they go to, uh, uh, go to um, Derby and Lystra, and all that is in that first journey in Acts 13 and Acts 14. Uh, we further believe that the Apostle Paul is the one and only man to whom the revelation of the mystery concerning the body of Christ and the dispensation of grace was revealed by the ascended Lord Jesus. So that statement, well, let, let's get those verses. Romans chapter 11, verse 13. Romans 11, verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. So... Uh, he, he, he certainly declares himself to be the apostle of the Gentiles there. He's the one and only person to whom the revelation of the mystery concerning the body of Christ, dispensation of grace was revealed. So uh, I magnify mine office. I am the apostle of the Gentiles. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 1, we read about Paul uh, receiving the revelation of the mystery. Ephesians 3, 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he may known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four and few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ, by the gospel. So, um, again, Paul, uh, so keep your hand here, and then we're coming back to it. Go over to Galatians chapter 1. Because in Galatians 1, Paul also points to the importance of his, his apostleship. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10, verse 10 to 12. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then if you go down to verse um, 15 of Galatians 1. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years, I went up with Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. So Paul here is talking about his, his call to ministry, if you will, and him receiving this revelation, uh, which he, he neither received of man, neither was taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ uh, and, and how unique that was. Um, so, but one thing about this, um, when we say the mystery concerning the body of Christ and dispensation of grace was revealed by the ascended Lord Jesus Christ, uh, Paul is the one and only man. Yeah, so that's a true statement the way it stands there. But if you look in Ephesians, and I read the two extra verses here on purpose, Paul says in verse 5, so this mystery that he had in verse 3 and 4, Verse 5, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So were there other people to whom this message was revealed? There were. His holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. There were apostles and prophets in the early church. There were, you know, the gift of tongues, the gift of, of prophecy, the gift of a word of knowledge. All those gifts are making known this truth. Um, but that verse says, revealed to his holy apostles and prophets, how? By the Spirit. You notice this statement says, Paul is the one and only man to whom the revelation of the mystery concerning the body of Christ and dispensation of grace was revealed by the ascended Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul, Paul never says, 
the Spirit taught him. Now, the Spirit inspired the Word, so in, the, in that Paul is writing Scripture, it's the Spirit writing Scripture, but who does he say, I, I, I neither received it, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. So that's, that's a distinction, and it makes Paul's ministry unique and his selection as an apostle unique because he is selected by and taught by and has revealed to him the truth by the ascended Christ as opposed to one of the spiritual gifts, you know, receiving uh, prophecy by the Spirit or, or, or receiving a message from an apostle by the Spirit. That's a different thing. So, so while other people did receive revelation and teach revelation until the scripture was complete, Paul is, the own, Paul is unique in that he saw the ascended Christ, was taught by the ascended Christ, and, and uh, received the revelation of the mystery directly from the ascended Christ, not just through the Spirit. So that's a, just a little distinction there. Um, don't want to give the, you know, get tripped up on the idea that we say Paul is the only one. He is the only one that received it by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Others did receive it by the Spirit. Um, then the next statement, Paul is not in any way a part of the ministry of the 12 apostles. And that's, you know, Galatians chapter 1. We read that passage. And uh, Galatians chapter 2. We should look at that one while we were here. Because this is a very common teaching is that Paul took the place of Judas. He became the 13th apostle, if you uh, were, well, not really the 13th. He became the 12th. There's, there's, some people question, was Matthias really legitimate, you know, because he was selected by man and all. And some people say, well, Paul joined the 12. But Paul was not one of the 12. There were 12 apostles when he came on the scene. He's not the 13th either in that he's unique. He's one. Uh, Galatians 2, um, let's just go down to verse 6. But of these who seem to be somewhat, and he's talking about the, 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 church, the kingdom church leaders there at Jerusalem, Peter and James and John. Of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought affectionately in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. So Paul distinguishes his ministry from that of the twelve. Peter, James, and John, and that's James, the head of the church in Jerusalem, not the Apostle James, but he distinguishes himself from their ministry. He's going to the uncircumcision, they're going to the circumcision. He has the gospel of the uncircumcision, they have the gospel of the circumcision. They're going to stay with that little flock of believers, he's going out to the heathen, to the Gentiles. So he's not in any way a part of their ministry, he has a separate and distinct ministry. And then we further believe that until this message was revealed to and through the Apostle Paul, it was never revealed to man. And we read the passage in Ephesians 3 about being hid from ages from generations. If you go back to Romans 16 and verse 25, so that's the unique thing about Paul uh, also is that he was the first to receive this revelation. Um, he received it from the Lord Jesus Christ and he received it first. Romans 16, verse 25, Now to him is the power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. And by the, and, uh, by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So he was... Um, it's the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. And then in Colossians chapter 1, we'll look at that passage because we hadn't looked at it yet. Colossians 1 and verse number 25. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which been, hath been hid from ages from generations but is made manifest to his but now is made manifest to his saints to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the gentiles which is Christ in you 
the hope of glory. So that, that mystery, again, hidden from ages, from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. So um, that's the, 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 you know, the, 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 the point behind that whole, that whole point is the distinct ministry and message of Paul. That it's Paul that received the revelation of the mystery. It's Paul that proclaimed it. He was not a part of the other 12. He was a separate, distinct apostle to the Gentiles. Any questions, comments about that one? We'll, we'll make that the last one for tonight. So, because we're getting into a new The Daily Walk of Believers next week. So, should we um, say something about uh, Paul being the one? I mean, you, you just read it that the dispensation of grace was given to him. And, I mean, he's the apostle of the Gentiles, but the, the dispensation of grace given to him for me, to me for you yeah. to fulfill the word of God and in, in another place it says the dispensation of the gospel is um, committed unto me yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah. That, that would kind of preclude you know the acts to preclude. somebody else yeah, yeah me yeah 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 we can certainly add that in to that statement yeah 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 and that would keep in line with you know, we're trying to, to make our statements match the wording of Scripture as much as possible, too. So, yeah, yeah. So. Any other questions or comments about those two? And then we'll start next week, the Daily Walk of Believers, finish that up pretty quick, and then we have to put, put out our new, our new and reproved and updated and revised version of this. So, all right, let's have a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we do thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the opportunity we've had this evening of looking toward and studying together. And as we've done so, we pray that, that your word might be to us more than just words on a page, but that it might live in our hearts and lives, that we would be living epistles of your mercy and your grace. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.